Right, so last lecture we had um, discussed the uh, Benetic and uh, Martensitic transformations as examples of shear transformations. And I had uh, shown you this slide um, telling you how, which tells us how the original gamma, austenite gamma lattice is sheared uh, to Martensite. And that gives rise to, of course, a lattice shear plus a uh, volume expansion. And we can also see on the, the same slide that uh, for that specific shear, uh, certain 111 planes uh, are, uh, gamma 111 planes are transformed to uh, 110 uh, uh, planes of, of Martensite very nicely. Okay, so there will be uh, orientation relationships between the parent phase, the austenite phase, and, and the um, product phase, the uh, martensite. All right. Again, uh, I want to point out that uh, for many steels, uh, low carbon steels, when we make martensite from low carbon steels, we get the slab martensite microstructure. But as we go to, uh, to higher uh, carbon contents, we will get uh, a different type of martensite, uh, as you can see on the image here on the, uh, uh, sorry, let's go back. Um, yeah, on the uh, uh, left, you can see uh, these uh, this feathery uh, type of uh, martensite. And then in the background, you still get this uh, clear uh, contrast from the retained austenite. Uh, that's one type of mar ferrous martensite. Uh, there are some uh, many other uh, martensite morphologies. For instance, on the right, you see the morphology uh, of um, uh, epsilon martensite. Mm, it's hexagonal martensite that you will form in certain iron uh, manganese uh, uh, alloys, which are highly alloyed in manganese. To get something like this, you would you'd have to typically alloy uh, the iron to about <coughs> 15, 20 percent of, of uh, manganese. All right. So uh, the uh, subject of uh, martensite brings us to the topic of <coughs> hardenability. And um, what what is hardenability? Uh, what it's a concept that's very widely used for engineering steels. Mm. Um, so in engineering steels, for instance, if you make a, uh, a crankshaft for a motor, um, uh, you will talk, you will, you'll say that the steel that you use is, is very hardenable. Mm. The same if you are producing ball bearings, you, you will use a steel which is very hardenable. So what does it mean? Well, in, in a nutshell, it just means that uh, it's easy to make martensite, yes? Uh, right, the concept is a little bit more difficult to explain when it comes to technology. Um, first of all, the, uh, the concept of hardenability is related to the steel and its compositions, yes? Because that has an impact on the transformation kinetics. It's one thing. And then the second thing is it has, uh, it's also, the hardenability is also determined by the conditions, uh, the cooling conditions. And the cooling conditions of a part will depend on the fluid that we use, how we apply the, the cooling, and how massive, yes, uh, is the part that we cool. So there is a need to, um, to make sure that these elements uh, are brought together in the, the, the concept of hardenability. So one of the tests uh, that uh, uh, is being used to, uh, to determine the hardenability of a steel is called a, uh, a Jomini test, a Jomini end quench test, because we quench the end of a bar that has been austenitized. And this is shown in the, the figure on the slide, you have a, a rod, it's this uh, red colored rod here, 
uh, that's hanging from this uh, blue uh, suspension rake. Um, and um, so y you put it uh, in there after you've austenitized the material. Yes? And um, at the uh, bottom of the, uh, the rig, there is a water jet that uh, uh, cools off the end, one of the ends of this Chomini bar. And you can see, of course, that uh, the end is, is black because it's cooling down. And you can see that gradually this black cold end expands and, uh, and the, as the bar uh, cools down. Yeah? So um, now if you take this bar and you uh, make a flat uh, part on it so that you can uh, do hardness tests, what you find schematically is on the cooling end, you will have a high hardness. And towards the, the farther you go from the quenched end, the softer the material uh, will be. Yeah. That, that, that's, that's here, you see at, at the start. At the end here, yes, the material is very hard, and then as we go, it gets less and less hard. And the reason, of course, is because uh, the further you are away from the quenched ends, the lower the cooling rate was. Hmm? Okay, so you can you can have a Jomini uh, test. You can also have tests, uh, simple quench tests, where you quench, for instance, a cylindrical bar. Yes, um, by spraying, by doing a water cooling, a water quench uh, from all sides of this bar. And then uh, you measure the hardness as a function of the radius. And what you find is, of course, again, the surface is very hard because that's where you have the highest cooling rates. And as you go to the interior of the material, it becomes softer and softer. And um, obviously, if this is the hardness, say the level of hardness for martensite, yes, and this is the level of hardness of martensite, you can see that only this zone here, this outer zone, is is hardened. Yes. Okay. So let's have um, a look at uh, this hardenability concept now in more in more details using. Uh, some, some actual data. So we will be looking at 0.4% carbon steels. And we will look at three steels, the uh, 1040, the 8640, and the 4340. These are um, uh, steel uh, grade designations used in, um, by the, um, uh, in North America mainly, and the 40, the 40 points to the, the fact that you have 0.4 carbon. Mm -hmm. in, so all these three steels have 0.4 carbon. The, um, and we do now a Jomini test on them. And so we measure after the test the hardness, the Rockwell hardness, as a function of the distance from the quenched end. So at this end here, close to zero, the uh, the quench rate is very high, and we have martensite, yeah, before martensite. As we, um, uh, let's first look at the 1040. As we uh, measure the hardness away from the quenched end, we see a very strong decrease in the hardness, yes? Okay, so we say this material is not very hardenable because it will only quench harden, harden to martensite at the very end of the Jomini test, passing. If we use the 8640, we see a different type of har hardenability. Here we see that the hardness is very much higher. Yes. And so we, we say the 8640 has a hard hardenability than the uh, 1040. We can uh, look also at the 4340, and there we see another behavior. We see a material that's extremely hardenable. In fact, the hardness barely dis uh, uh, decreases with the, uh, with the distance from the quench end. So this is a very hardenable material, meaning that I don't need very high 
quenching rates or cooling rates to achieve uh, a martensitic microstructure throughout a part that I want to heat treat. And how is this achieved? Well, the 1040 has no alloying elements to speak of. The 8640 has chromium, molybdenum, yes, and half a percent of manganese, yes. In the uh, 4340, we have an even higher chromium content, almost four times as much manganese, and some molybdenum again. So it is the alloying who gives us this higher hardenability. Hmm? Now, of course, uh, this uh, profile here gives me a hardness profile. I want to relate this to the amount of martensite that I've formed. Yes, okay. So first of all, and, and so I need a graph that tells me, that it gives me the hardness, the Rockwell hardness, so it's the same scale as here on the left, as a function of the carbon content, yes, for different amounts of martensite, volume percentage of martensite. All right, so what do I see? What does this graph tell me? The graph tells me that if here at the very edge of end of my Jomini specimen, I have a hardness a little bit in excess of 55 Rockwell C, I bring this over here and I go here and I see where it crosses my vertical line with the 0.4% of carbon, 0.4% of carbon being the, uh, the carbon content of my steel. I see that this corresponds, this harness corresponds to 99% of martensite, yes? And, as, and, and so you can see that uh, for the 4340, the hardness uh, decreases after two inch, that's five centimeters, barely below 55 barely below 55. So in this case, um, I get a martensite over almost five centimeters of uh, below the quenched end. And so, and it's 99 to 95% of martensite microstructure. Um, <coughs> so um, one of the interest, the, the, the thing in technology that uh, we look at is how far away from the quench end do we have to go to achieve 50% of martensite? Well, we have here our 50% martensite line, yes? And uh, this is my vertical line giving me the nominal. So 50% of martensite is achieved at about half an inch, uh, say about a little over a centimeter uh, away from the quenched end. Good. The uh, so so uh, this allows me this uh, the the diagrams I just had allow me to relate uh, hardness profile to depth of uh, uh, hardening of martensite formation. I can also of course, um, and I'm more interested in that, um, wonder how if I have a cylindrical or a bar, yes, and it's being quenched, how do I correlate the results from my Jomini test, which is a, a, a cooling from one end, yes, how do I correlate this with the microstructure, the hardness that I can get inside my cylindrical bar, hmm? okay? Well, again, on the left, we have the same diagram we just had about the hardenability, yes? And on the right, we now have the, a diagram which has the same x-axis, namely the distance from the quenched end in a Jomini test, yes? And we cool here, remember, uh, remind you, in the Jomini test we cooled at one end, and then the equivalent bar diameter. Hmm? Okay, so it basically means, uh, say, if I take a line here, right, a line here, 
for instance. I, I'll choose one of the lines and we'll go through the other lines. And this line says, uh, obviously relates the distance from the quenched end to the equivalent bar diameter. And it says then, um, if I have uh, a little over half an inch from distance from the quenched end, I w this will correspond to about 3.5 inch in diameter, yes, of hardening. Okay, now there are other lines in this diagram. The one we chosen was ideal. That is, what is an ideal, uh, what, what does the word ideal refer to? Well, it refers to the type of cooling. When the, um, the temperature of your surface, yes, metal surface, and the temperature of your coolant are the same, yes, we talk about an ideal cooling. You know, you can't, th th that is a situation where the cooling cannot be, the heat transfer cannot be uh, better, yes? Um, if we use water, yes, cool will water, uh, so it depends on whether the water is circulating or still, yes? We will get another efficiency of heat transfer. If we use oil, the, uh, the heat transfer will be uh, slightly less, so that means that um, distance from a quenched end, a water quenched end, I remember, remind you of the fact that this is water, yes, um, uh, uh, will, uh, the, the, cor the diameter that corresponds to this uh, distance, a certain distance from quenched end, yes, um, varies for different severity of quenches, yes? and so the, when you have an ideal uh, quench, it's very, we call it very severe, etc. And then water is less severe, and oil is a, a really uh, relatively um, uh, less severe. And that's the reason why, um, for the same quenched end uh, distance, you get smaller and smaller bar diameters that you can. Um, uh, that you can cool to get 50% of uh, martensite in the center of this uh, bar. Yeah. So in, in, in technology, the severity of quenching is, is, uh, is usually referred to as this H parameter. Hmm? Okay. Good. So a... Um, if a material is very, uh, a steel is very hardenable, it means that if you do water quench, yes, yes I will get 90% of martensite at the center, for instance, yes. A less hardenable steel, we will, the diameter, yes, uh, over which, uh, diameter of the bar over which we can achieve uh, full martensite will be smaller. Okay. Good. So, uh, if we um, look at the uh, 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 hardenability, hmm, one of the, the ways in uh, in which uh, we uh, present it is um, the cooling, yes? We we you, you can also present the uh, uh, hardening data, hardenability data, excuse me, um, by uh, looking at the hardness, yes, that you obtain at different cooling rates. Mm. So if you have a hardness, a certain hardness, as a function of this cooling rate, yeah, mm, you see that as the, uh, the in, in this particular case, that the parameter that's used to uh, determine the cooling rate is this T850. Yeah. So that is the time, yes, 
it, uh, it takes to go from 800 to 500 degrees C. Mm -hmm. So if this parameter is high, it means a low cooling rate. Mm -hmm. Low cooling rate. Mm -hmm. If this parameter is short, so that it, you go very quickly from 800 to 500 degrees C, then you have a high cooling rate. So it's a little bit uh, the reverse from the usual situation mm -hmm. where uh, so a low cooling rate is towards the right and a high cooling rate is. So a, an, a material, yes, that uh, has a, that is more hardenable shown on this type of graph, yes, uh, would look like this. So first of all, uh, it would, uh, a, a material that's less hardenable would look like this. That means for, for a certain uh, high cooling rate, I achieve a much lower hardness, yes? Mm -hmm. uh, a material that is more hardenable, yes, uh, would look like this on this graph because I can achieve a high hardness, i.e. martensite, at a lower cooling rate, okay? In general, in uh, so th there are different ways to look at um, hardenability. And uh, one of the concepts that is uh, used in practice is so-called the, the, the DI concept. Mm -hmm. And for that, I need to go one, uh, one slide back, so excuse me. Mm -hmm. So what is this DI? This DI mm -hmm. is, uh, is the diameter, yes, of the round bar, yes, that corresponds to mm, the uh, uh, the a certain level, ninety percent of martensite in the center. In the center, ninety percent of martensite in the center for an ideal quench. Okay, so a, a steel composition that will give me a certain diameter where it's 90% martensite in the center, when you have 90% uh, in the center. And so, uh, so meaning basically that uh, when I do an ideal quench, the diameter is equal to di, mm, and, and the radius is di. So, uh, right, and this should be 100, 100%. It's diameter 100% at the set for ideal quench uh, conditions. Mm. It means that the coolant and the bar temperature are the same. So, so this um, parameter can be defined as a DC value multiplied with parameters that are related to the uh, composition. Yeah. So this DC value is a value that's tabulated and it's based on carbon, austenite grain size and the severity of the quench which goes from uh, ideal, H is infinite to 0.25 for still oil. Mm. So, so, so let me give you an example. For instance, um, this DI uh, is obtained by saying, okay, I want to, so, so I want this DI is, is a, a technical a number here, right? And this can be achieved using uh, a certain carbon content, a certain grain size, and a certain composition. Mm. For instance, this DC would be 14 times uh, parameters for the manganese, silicon, and uh, etc. condition. Mm -hmm. So DI will, for instance, be 67. This will be a requirement mm -hmm. when when uh, people buy engineering steels, bar steels. They need a certain hardening performance. Yes. Well, uh, that is, for instance, this value. Then 
the steel maker has to translate this in what will be the composition of the steel to achieve this. So, for instance, um, uh, and, and these um, uh, multiplying factors, these f values, are uh, given as a function of the, so these multiplying factors, for instance, f, say, uh, let's go back, for instance, um, multiplying factor silicon is one, yeah? which means very low silicon content. Um, right. The uh, first, let's look at this uh, DC uh, value. Hmm? DIC, because um, it's we're looking at ideal quenching, right? So DIC depends on the uh, carbon content yeah? and depends on the grain size. So say, if we have a grain size of uh, six, right? two hundred grain size, okay, and we have a 0.3 percent carbon, yes, then the uh, DIC or the DI value is the C value, excuse me, is 40. Yeah. And if our steel composition uh, contains, let me go back uh, one more. Yeah. So this was for manganese, 2.2. So 2.2 is here. So that meant we had about uh, probably about 1% of uh, manganese. Okay. And that gives me 2.2. So that means that two, if I only had 1% uh, of manganese, it would give me about a 28, uh, a DI of 28 uh, uh, millimeters. In this case, it's millimeters, I think. Mm, yes, millimeters, 28 millimeters. And of course, that value can increase if you have added other alloying elements, okay? Uh, this method is uh, of sometimes named uh, Grossman pr hardenability prediction, yes? Mm -hmm. And uh, the multiplying factors, uh, there are, uh, there is the, the table I show you here. Uh, this is uh, another example here. Um, where the um, where we use a multiplying factor for carbon rather than a DC value, hmm? and here is a more recent um, uh, figure for the determination of the multiplying factor for alloying elements, which can be used instead of uh, the diagram here. Okay. Now. Um, the uh, multiplying factors um, uh, sometimes um, uh, will vary depending on the composition of the, of the steel. And in particular, uh, you remember that I said uh, that boron was an element that was very good at suppressing the uh, nucleation of uh, ferrite, of the, the pro um, Pro-eutectoid uh, ferrite nucleation, so it definitely helps to have uh, boron to um, suppress ferrite and promote uh, and make it easier for for marcasite to uh, nucleate. So, uh, in the presence of carbon, however, yes. The effect of boron is reduced, yes, uh, to almost nothing. And the reason is because carbon and boron compete for grain boundary sites. And so is, if you have lots of carbon, the boron is uh, replaced by carbon at austenite grain boundaries. And of course, if there's no bo uh, 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 boron at grain boundaries, you get, uh, you, s you simply get a, uh, a uh, reduction of the effectiveness of boron in uh, as, as a hardenability element, and it's shown here. So, if uh, there is 
very little carbon or no carbon, the boron factor yes, is, is about three. Yeah? So this means that you, you get a threefold increase in, in diameters in threefold, threefold increase in the diameter uh, that um, over which you will have marked beside in, in for instance above. If you have a if your steel is prolytic for instance you will have uh, a boron factor which is close to one so that means uh, you may as well not add boron uh, as it, uh, it your hardenability will not improve. Yeah. All right, so um, we have um, discussed uh, quite a few things. Now let's see uh, whether uh, these thermal treatments uh, we have discussed, these transformations, uh, whether uh, and how they're being used in, in practice. And let's have uh, first uh, test what we know by, s by looking at three uh, thermal cycles and very simple thermal treatments. Yeah. For instance, if we have a cycle where we uh, osnotize the material, we cool to 350 degrees. Uh, we stay there for 10,000 seconds and then we cool to room temperature. What's the microstructure that we get? Well, very simple. We go from austenite, we go to 350, that's about here, and we stay there 10,000 seconds, 10 seconds, 100, 1,000, 10,000. So what's happened here? I have started making bainite at about 10 seconds. I finished making bainite at a little over 100 seconds. So basically, I created bainite. So here I have bainite. Yes? Yes, bainite. And when I cool, of course, nothing much, nothing happens. And I'm left with a bainitic, fully bainitic microstructure at the room temperature. Let's repeat. Uh, with the same steel. Now we cool to 250, we hold 100 seconds, and then we cool to room temperature, okay? So when we do this, we come from this temperature, fully austenitic, decrease to 250, yes? And uh, when we keep the temperature at uh, 250 for 100 seconds, nothing happens also. There is no transformation whatsoever until we cool down to room temperature, and then we create martensite, and there may be some traces, as I said, of retained austenite, depending on the position of the martensite finish temperature. Uh, cycle three, we now cool to uh, 630. We hold 10 seconds there. We cool to 400 degrees C's, hold 1,000 seconds, and then we cool to room temperature. What's the microstructure? So we go from austenite, go to 650, or 630 rather, keep it there for 10 seconds. 10 seconds is here, so that means I will s transform the structure to 50% perlite, and the remaining is, the remaining 50% austenite is transformed when I cool to 400 degrees C and transform the uh, remaining austenite to bainite. Yeah. So I get, uh, so here I create 50% bainite. Yeah. So 50% perlite and 50% bainite is what we get. Yeah. So that note that there's nothing happens when I cross the MS and MF temperature because everything has been transformed. Yeah. All right. So um, you would say, of course, that um, or think that perhaps this kind of um, uh, thermal cycles uh, is not found in industry because they, I don't know, maybe they're too simple or so there are no products that use this. That's not the case, for instance. This is an example of uh, a uh, continuous heat treatment furnace uh, uh, where we heat treat uh, strips, uh, narrow strips uh, of sheet steel. Hmm? You, you can see the strips here, yes, strips here. And here are the same strips, they're coiled, 
called of narrow band, yes? And, and this is uh, the unit, and the, the strips uh, move through the unit here and go uh, and, and get a, a thermal uh, treatment, yes? So let's have a look at what kind of treatments they get. Hmm? Well, for instance, you can outstamper the material, yes? Outstampering is a, another word it's very, uh, that's used for uh, uh, bainite transformation, bainitic transformation. So what we have here, the uh, equipment, the line is set up with the, an oscillatizing furnace first, then a molten metal quench, so you molten metal, so that uh, um, you uh, basically can start the isothermal transformation, a leveling furnace, yes, okay, and then a tempering furnace, yes, tempering furnace uh, where you uh, keep the strip, yeah, and what it basically does is you go, uh, uh, where you, you, you keep the, the, the furnace at certain temperature so that carbides are formed, hmm? and then you cool it, and then you, you coil the strip back, yes, but now uh, instead of being a ferrite perlite microstructure, it is a uh, benitic microstructure. So, okay, and and here you see the uh, the transformation, uh, the way the transformation is uh, is done, the thermal cycle. You can have mar tempering. In this case, you ma you make martensite, as the word says it, uh, and and you temper the martensite. So, so. So now the, the, the system is laid out uh, a bit differently. You have an austenitizing furnace, yes, where you make the austenite. Molten metal quench, so you quench the material, the, your the steel. So you go through the MF, MF, MS, MF temperature range, so you form martensite, yes. Um, then leveling surface uh, uh, furnace, so you get the temperature of the, uh, the strip is equalized, yes? And then you reheat it, you reheat it to precipitate carbides, and that will give you the, uh, the tempering. And you uh, cool down, jet cooling, and you coil the strip uh, for, uh, and then you process the, the steel to do, um, uh, to produce something with it. Okay. Um, these um, the kind of products, for instance, that uh, you get from uh, more tempering or so, are uh, light uh, metal saws, uh, saws, wood saws, things like this. Um, that's that's where uh, that's how they're made. Um, bar uh, products uh, are uh, particularly uh, special quality bars hmm, uh, are also heat treated hmm. for instance uh, so, so these are just long long uh, bars yes uh, in this case we do uh, we can do the heating by induction so the bar is passed uh, through a set of uh, induction coils and heated to the austenitizing temperature. So you have austenite, austenite here. In the quenching part, uh, you uh, make the martensite transformation. And you can see how this is done in this unit. You basically roll, the bar would move from the back here to the front hmm, on these special rollers. And, um, and then the spray nozzles here would spray the quenching fluid water onto the bar. And then after that, uh, you have martensite. After that, you do a, low, an, a lower temperature tempering, so the material regains its, its toughness. We'll come uh, to that in a moment. Um, so heating, cooling, uh, uh, reheating, uh, is uh, very often 
uh, used in uh, thermal treatments of, uh, of steels, in particular engineering uh, steels. In the uh, 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 thermal uh, treatment technology, it, there is also a uh, uh, situations very often where you'd like to simplify the, uh, the thermal treatments. Mm -hmm. For instance, um, conventionally quenched and tempered uh, steels usually go to quite a lot of heating and cooling cycles. Mm -hmm. For instance, um, conventional quenched and tempered steels um, usually referred to Q, Q, QNT or QT steels. Yes, QT steels. You often see this. Um, what you have to do is you uh, usually, uh, when you make a part, a forged part, for instance, um, you uh, need to heat up the part to in the high temperature state you can so you can easily deform or make the part and then you cool the uh, the part and you ready it for thermal treatment which will involve osnotizing yes making martensite gamma 2 alpha martensite this martensite being supersaturated solution of carbon you need to temper it yes and then do you, uh, as a consequence of the uh, heat treatment, very often we have distortions. So the, the part may need some straightening. Yeah? So you have the dimensional, uh, the right dimensions. Yeah? And as a consequence, you introduce internal stresses and you need stress, low temperature stress relief uh, thermal treatment. So that makes a lot for a lot of uh, heating and cooling cycles and there are um, special steels yes that have been developed so that uh, you avoid tempering yes and you don't need to quench the steel because it, it has a high hardenability so uh, you uh, so you don't need to quench you don't need to temper the steel and uh, for instance the uh, vanadium micro alloyed ferrite plus perlite steels, uh, you only need to uh, reheat them so you can do the forging and um, do a careful, a well uh, controlled uh, cooling, yes, to achieve uh, a, uh, a high strength, yes, good toughness material. So the hardening is by controlled air cooling. Hmm? And there is no need for additional heat treatment, of with the exception maybe of a surface hardening treatment. Hmm? Right? And a typical example here of these uh, microalloyed, and they're the microalloyed, the vernadium microalloyed steels, and the, uh, the hardening is uh, realized by precipitation strengthening. Um, and you can see here um, the vanadium is of the order of 0.1% and uh, you precipitate vanadium carbides and vanadium nitrides. Hmm? Uh, the, uh, you also see in the composition that the sulfur hmm, which usually we try to have very low, yeah, very low, uh, is here rather uh, large. You have numbers which go up to 600 ppm. And the reason is, is because that improves machinability. And for parts like uh, this uh, crankshaft, uh, that, is, that is important. Okay? So uh, thermal treatments are a necessity but there are clever ways to avoid them. Hmm? Okay. Even for these very large forgings, such as the one uh, of the example shown here, uh, uh, they will very often go to uh, complex heat treatments. Hmm? 
Here you can see the ingot cast, cast steel being reheated, yes, so that you can uh, forge it with the open die forging, yes, um, which can uh, be uh, carried out in multiple steps till you have a basic uh, rough shape of the part. Uh, and uh, so uh, this is then the, uh, the rough shape of the material the, uh, that is uh, heat treated after the forging. Then the, uh, this intermediate uh, shape is then heat treated, for instance here. First you remove the scale, scale removal. Yes, and here you see uh, the um, the shaft. The shaft is being uh, quenched. It has been reheated to austenite and is going to be quenched in this quench bath. Yes. All right, and this is um, a typical uh, an example of what a large shaft like this would be used for uh, as a uh, rotor shaft for a turbine and a generator. You can see here how this 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 central shaft here yes uh, will be uh, is obtained from from this original uh, part here after machining. Of course, one of the reasons why the uh, the composition must also take into account is uh, machining. All right, so. Um, as we uh, have seen, the increase of the carbon in uh, content in the steel will lead to an increase in tensile strength and yield strength, but the elongation will decrease. And the, the reason is because we add this brittle uh, compound, this cementite. Hmm? So if I have a hypo a eutectoid steel, yes, what I'll see. Uh, is an increase of the strength, which continues as I go into hyper eutectoid uh, steel. However, the, uh, yeah, the yield strength doesn't change very much. But what is important is as we do this, the um, elongation decreases linearly and the impact toughness decreases. So the material becomes very susceptible, susceptible to crack propagation. So it, it's not very resistant to crack propagation. Okay. Um, in all the cases, yes, in, in for all these carbon contents, yeah, the different carbon contents here, from very low to uh, hyper eutectoid, I can spherodize the uh, I can spherodize the uh, the cementite. And what I happens when I do this yes, is I see that there is a drop in hardness yes, uh, and an increase in ductility. So if I have very fine perlite, for instance, in a, hypo, in a hypo eutectoid steel, yes, um, I will have uh, a certain high hardness, which decreases if I have coarse perlite, which decreases even further if my perlite uh, is ferrodized, where the cementite forms spherical particles. Um, and uh, the reverse, for the same amount of carbon, uh, my ductility, my reduction here measured as a reduction of area. So it means if, you, if I have a, a cylindrical test sample, that is the reduction of area here that you get uh, after the test, after fracture, you see that the ductility increases, the reduction of air area becomes larger, and it's be extremely large if you have spherodite uh, material. So uh, the distribution, morphology of the, the cementite is very important for, the, uh, for both the strength and the ductility of your material. Uh, 
something similar happens with uh, if we now take as our reference the uh, the, the perlite situation. So uh, if we look at the I go back here. If I look at the fine perlite, the and 100% fine perlite is at this level. This is about 77. 77% of carbon, right? So this point here, if I put it relative to the Martin side, this is where I am. So the Martin side we see is very, very much harder than um, fine perlite, yes? And, um, and, and, and we see that the, 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 the hardness of the Martin side is very much dependent on the carbon content. Yes. Actually, it's the main parameter. And so we also see that in technology of steels, yes, uh, there are many products which uh, depend for their hardness or particular hardness for uh, their hardness uh, on the carbon content. Yeah. For instance, if you would uh, look at uh, uh, carbon for, for carbon content of screws, structural steel, forging, dies, drills, files, yes, metal files, for instance, have very high carbon contents, yes. You see that um, w what we, we will do is we will harden the material by having very hard martensite where we have large amount of carbon in supersaturation, yes. We do this by quenching. Yeah. That's, however, as we do this, as we as we obtain this very hard uh, Martin side, yes, uh, we uh, our material is, is is not very tough. That means it 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 it, um, it is not very risk resistant to crack propagations, hmm? Hmm? and uh, we do a temper treatment, hmm? a temper a heat treatment, which gives me a decrease in uh, hardness or strength, still uh, much larger than the perlite or ferrite perlite microstructure I or had originally. But the advantage being that I have a high, uh, much higher toughness of the material. Hmm? So, uh, and, and that's why, and that's the, the essence of tempering. So tempering is essential to reduce brittleness of martensite, and it also removes internal stresses in the material, which are, which are caused by the quenching. What happens to the mi microstructure when we tamper? Well, very simple, we create very small carbides in the microstructure. Which is, so you can see this on the micrograph here, you had what in this lath, you have these lats of martensite, hmm? and you can basically see these little white uh, uh, lines, th those are uh, very fine carbides. Uh, so when you form carbide, there is no more carbon in solid solution in the martensite, and that uh, makes the material, the martensite likes hard, but also improves the toughness a lot. Hmm? And you can see this here, what happens to the strength of martensite as you temper. So here you temper at different temperatures, hmm? and you can see the tensile stress decreasing as you go, and the reduction of area or the, the ductility increasing. So in a nutshell, we, uh, in steels, in many steel products, we use steel microstructure controls, which are based on the transformation of austenite or the also said called the decomposition of austenite to pro eutectoid alpha and cementite, or if we have very high carbon steels, pro eutectoid cementite and, and ferrite. Uh, if we have exactly the uh, the 0.77 percent of carbon, we will generate perlite. And those microstructures we will obtain when we do slow cooling. Hmm? If we do moderately fast cooling, we get bainite. Yes? Bainite, 
again, I remind you of the fact that the transformation, the night transformation, is uh, occurs in a situation where you have no substitutional element diffusion, but interstitial element diffusion, so there is coronal diffusion. And then if we do rapid cooling, we have a transformation where there is absolutely no diffusion, yes? Yes. In this case, very often, we need to regain yes, uh, ductility and toughness by reheating, and, is, and this reheating is called tempering. And this, and that's the reason why we call the microstructures we observe of ferrite lats with very small uh, cementite particles. We that structure is called tempered martensite. Okay, so you can basically uh, make a very simple overview. Martin, if you go from martensite, tempered martensite, bainite, fine perlite, coarse perlite, spherodite, you go from a very high strength to a much lower strength material, and but vice versa, you go from a material that's very that's relatively brittle to a material with more ductility and what is also important, more toughness, uh, resistance against crack and formation. So up to now, we've been talking a lot about transformations. We, haven't, we, we have talked about strength of steels, yes. Um, we will see in the coming lectures uh, that you have uh, that, that, that we will also uh, very often deform the steels. And the steels we deform um, will deform them at different temperatures. And if we do uh, this deformation in conditions where recrystallization uh, is very easy, we talk about hot working. So you have recrystallization. The material is relatively soft. So it takes less energy to deform. However, you may have oxidation, yeah, which has, ha will have an impact on the, the, the surface of the sheet. Yeah. And of course, you have less energy to deform the material, means the material is softer. Hmm. You can also do cold working. In this case, you can define cold working as a situation where there's no recrystallization. So no recrystallization, that means that after you've done the cold working, you don't find your nice grains, but all the grains are pancaked. They're cold deformed. So you will need to recrystallize, do recrystallization and you'll lay afterwards, after the cold work. Of course, it takes more energy to deform because the material has an increased strength. There is less oxidation. So um, any product that requires high surface quality will uh, be cold deformed rather than hot deformed. You get cold work microstructures. You get, in general, a product that's m uh, that has a more pronounced crystallographic texture and, and as a consequence is more anisotropic. Hmm? So uh, recrystallization uh, is required after, uh, if you have a process uh, where recrystallization is very sluggish, hmm? or if you do a cold deformation. Hmm? This is, and what happens, yeah, uh, this is an example here where you have a hot rolled material that does not recrystallize, it's a stainless steel, and below is hot rolled and annealed product, and you can see the microstructure where you have these very uh, pancaked grains, very pancaked grains, is replaced by equiaxed grains, yes, um, that are defect-free, that is the process of recrystallization. Now, the process of recrystallization, when you do hot forming, is, can be done at, uh, it's done during the hot deformation itself. In the case of a cold deformed material, you will have to add a thermal treatment, which is called a recrystallization annealing, yes? Um, there are, however, uh, 
a number in technology, a number of different annealing uh, types of annealing processes, and uh, we, yes, and, and we want to review this, yes, uh, because annealing is also an essential part of uh, heat treatments of steels. So, what the annealing means, you usually hold the the steel at a certain constant temperature, yeah, uh, for some time. And that time may be anywhere from a few minutes to a um, few days. And then you cool it down. Hmm? The heating rate, the cooling rate, the annealing temperature, annealing time are strictly controlled uh, to get specific microstructures. Hmm? Um, typical uh, types of annealing uh, is the stress relief annealing. Usually, these are not very high temperatures, yes? Uh, annealing, and what you're basically trying to do is uh, uh, reduce residual stresses, mm, which can be caused by plastic deformation, by transformation, by non-uniform cooling. Mm. Spherodization, we already talked about. This. You, uh, you make the steels very soft so that they can easily be machined or cold deformed. Mm. And uh, usually that's achieved by heating the steel to a temperature very close to the eutectoid temperature and <coughs> it requires a very long anneal, hmm? 15 to 24, 25 hours. Yeah? Full anneal, yeah? full anneal, you basically uh, heat and cool the uh, steel uh, with the purpose of getting a very coarse uh, perlite. Normalization, yes, normalization is, uh, is um, very simple. Um, you want, in many times, in many cases, uh, to have a steel microstructure with very uniform and relatively small grain size. Now, the best way to do this is to go through the transformation. So you uh, re austenitize the material and then you cool it down. So that will refine the grain. Hmm? So if you have <coughs> uh, steels which have large grains, normalization is used to obtain smaller and uniform uh, grains. And then you have process anneal. Hmm? Um, that is uh, usually a recrystallization anneal that is done to, uh, to correct negative effects of cold working. Hmm? And uh, so when you cold work material, you, you gain a lot of strength. Material becomes very hard, it strain hardens. You need to uh, soften the material. You do this by recovery annealing or by recrystallization. So it's very common uh, procedure after a cold deformation, such as cold rolling. Okay, so if we look at the uh, uh, the uh, uh, iron carbon diagram, and we look at the uh, the iron rich corner of this uh, iron carbon diagram, iron carbon diagram um, we can have a normalizing tr uh, 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 treatment. In this case, you you reheat to a temperature that's above, temperature is in the austenite stability range. It's you, you transform and so you go twice through the transformation, so that gives you a, a grain refinement and a uniform grain. A process anneal is essentially uh, what you want to do is recrystallize the material. You don't uh, want to transform the material, you just want to. Uh, get rid of your uh, strongly, uh, your, your, your grains with a very high dislocation density. So you go through a temperature where you recrystallize the material. The recrystallization is rather a quick process, so you don't need to stay at this high temperature uh, for more than a few minutes, yes? Uh, stress relief doesn't require more than recovery annealing, yes? yes? So that is at a much lower temperature, about 600 
degree, 650 is the temperature where you get recovery. Beyond that, uh, you get, uh, at higher temperature that is, you get recrystallization. Uh, there's not much difference in terms of temperature between spherodizing and recrystallization, except the times. Hmm? To, uh, to spherodize uh, the uh, perlite, you need a very long annealing times, hours, 15, 25 hours, 24 hours. So um, to uh, coarsen the carbide, you need very long time. So that's the big difference, essentially, between a process anneal and a, and a spherodizing treatment. Okay, so uh, we will today conclude uh, this introductory session hmm, uh, where we basically uh, reviewed some fundamental concepts. Hmm. So we kind of have the, the entire class on the same wavelength. We talked about composition of steels, crystal structure, microstructure, strength, aspect, etc. And we are now again familiar with the relations between microstructures and properties and how uh, microstructure is controlled very strongly by thermal cycles and the decomposition of the austenite that we obtain as a consequence. Uh, and we've also seen that microstructure controls strength of uh, the steels property, and which is a fundamental property of steels. And now uh, we will use uh, many of these concepts to uh, describe, to go into the industrial processing of actual steel products. Okay. Um, before we do that, uh, next uh, time we reconvene, we will first talk about more uh, mundane uh, uh, subject, namely the classification of steels through standardization and why that is important and why we should uh, pay some attention to that uh, before uh, we go on to, uh, to talk about actual steel products. Okay, well, thank you very much for your attention, and uh, I will uh, see you uh, next week.